You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 407, Exodus Old and New with Michael Morales. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Can't complain. Looking forward to this interview, actually. I have been for uh, a good good chunk of time. Yeah, before you tell us what we're going to be talking about, uh, we do have a discount uh, for his book on our website, nakedbiblepodcast.com. So be sure you go there to get it. And Mike, what are we going to be discussing today? We're going to be talking about the Exodus. I know, sh- right. shock of shock. You know, we, we spent so much time, you know, talking about it, taking a real granular look at it. But this is sort of the bird's eye view of how things in the Exodus, the, the way the story is told, not just in the book of Exodus, but really the, the wider Old Testament, how patterns emerge from the whole episode in Israel's history. And, and these, these patterns are intelligent, they're intentional, and they get worked out in the way Jesus gets presented in the New Testament ultimately. So we're going to be doing some dot connecting across the Testaments using the Exodus event. But we're excited to have L. Michael Morales with us on the podcast, as we noted. And Boy, there are a lot of things we could do uh, with Dr. Morales. I'm going to ask him to introduce himself a little bit first. You know, again, just the basics, Michael, who you are, where you went to school, your uh, your your doctoral work, maybe. You know, if if that was something that you know will interest the audience, please tell us what that was. What do you teach? All those introductory sorts of things just help us to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, really grateful. So yes, my name is Michael, and I was born and raised in South Florida. My parents are from Havana. Skipping a lot of the, the journey to my uh, graduate uh-huh. work, I did uh, my dissertation under Gordon Wenham in the UK mm-hmm. on uh, in the books of Genesis and Exodus. I'm now uh, living with my uh, wife, Elise. I've got four sons, ages 17 down to 11, and I'm teaching at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Greenville, South Carolina. So I teach courses in the Pentateuch, Old Testament Biblical Theology, New Testament Biblical Theology, uh, Hebrew exegesis, prophets, uh, I guess the standard biblical studies stuff. Yeah, well, you got some choice titles there. <laughs> Anybody who gets to teach Pentateuch, there's yes. just so much there. Uh, yes. So your, your, your parents are from Havana. Yes, they came after the revolution, and uh, as teenagers, actually, they actually met in South Florida. Wow. Well, but that's quite a story. It is, yes. My uh, grandfather wound up in prison, somehow escaped. He was part of the uh, intellectual imprisonments, and Mm -hmm. the Lord was kind, um, used that whole situation to to bring my grandfather and and my parents to himself. So in the end, we're really grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, we want to focus on your your book. Uh, Again, your name is going to be familiar to my audience because you're the Leviticus guy. And we actually, we started the podcast doing Leviticus. So it was kind of a, I don't, it was, it was kind of an inside joke because when, when Trey convinced me that I should not have canceled the podcast, you know, when it was, it was seven, eight years ago now, because I, I was doing it myself and I couldn't, I couldn't do it logistically. I said, well, we're going to we're going to do Leviticus. If anybody we have any listeners after Leviticus, then we'll know we have something. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually did that. And, and so your your name has been invoked uh, in, in a number of episodes because of your work in Leviticus. But today uh, we're going to focus on your your more recent title, Exodus New and Old, A Biblical Theology of Redemption. And we we actually took a really granular tour through Exodus on the podcast. Uh, it, it took us, I guess, a year, something like that, to, to get through it. But today we're going to be taking sort of the wide-angle lens look at it from the perspective of, you know, biblical theology and these these consistent patterns that 
you're going to cross between testaments that inform us that what Jesus did, okay, the way his his work is characterized is often as a new Exodus, a new Moses, these these sorts of themes. And so I want to get into that with you. And, and this is an excellent resource. I want my audience to know, you know, yeah, some of this you're going to have heard of before, and, and that puts you ahead of the game. If you know the phrase new Exodus, that's a good thing. There's a lot of people in church that this sort of content doesn't filter down, but it's really important for thinking theologically uh, across your testaments. But we want to take a quick look you know, in this episode specifically on these sorts of themes. And you know, we're naturally going to get into Pentateuch and Torah and all different parts of the Old Testament because the new Exodus, the Exodus theme, these patterns carry through Scripture. And so this is, once again, for those of you in, in my audience, this is the sweet spot, one of these interviews where if I'm, if I'm recommending the book, I know you'll love it because it does biblical theology. It connects dots. We like to connect dots here. And there, there are a few that are you know, more important than the ones we'll talk about today. So but let's just jump into the book. You, you begin the book with an introduction called Exile Before Exodus. So what are you getting at with that chapter title? I mean, that's, that's kind of an, an intriguing title just to, you know, to ramp things up. How does it set up the rest of the book? Yeah, I, um, you know, when we think of the fall of humanity into sin, we often just focus on, well, there was a transgression of God's law, and so we need forgiveness of sins. But when we really look at the biblical story and do biblical theology, we see that that, that whole idea of um, sinning and being separated from God is presented in terms of, of exile. And so in writing a book where I'm trying to demonstrate that salvation is the pattern of the Exodus, we need to first demonstrate that um, the Exodus is necessary because our natural state and condition now, apart from salvation, is that of exile. And so, you know, obviously with Adam and Eve, when they sin, they're, they're exiled from the Garden of Eden. And really, the book of Genesis, before you come to the book of Exodus, is, is a book entirely about exile. So, you know, Cain... Yeah, is, give us a, a few indicators of that. We, we just... Seth Postel is going to be fresh in the mind of, of a number of listeners here. So I'm hoping you guys will track similar paths here. I'm sure we will. Exodus, um, Seth is a, is a dear brother. And um, yes, we, we have a lot of overlap. So yeah, Genesis begins, you know, after creation with the exile of humanity, the first human couple uh, exiled from the Garden of Eden. The very next story finds in chapter four of Genesis. Cain being exiled further away from Eden, from God's presence in Eden. Uh, eventually, the world is, uh, humanity is wiped off the face of the earth in the flood, uh, while Noah and his family is saved. And there's sort of a new creation start. Noah's sort of like a new Adam figure. He has three mm -hmm. sons the way that Adam did. But as soon as you start over, then the, the exile begins, and we have humanity scattered into nations uh, mm -hmm. away from God. And then even the patriarchal narratives, which by and large um, is the beginning of God's work of bringing humanity back to himself. But if you look at the transition from Abraham to Jacob to the 12 sons, uh, the Lord meets with Abraham, you know, maybe frequently is too strong of a word, but he meets with him. We, we don't get the details. It seems like face to face. Once we get to Jacob, Jacob has these sort of visionary encounters like at Bethel. And then we get down to the 12 sons, and, you know, Joseph has dreams. So there's this distancing, but then the book ends in Egypt with Joseph buried. And so uh, Jacob himself, uh, like Moses at the end of the Pentateuch, will die outside of the land. And so there's this great theme of exile, but particularly the Tower of Babel that serves to indicate that the nations are in exile from God. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a reader may have been born and raised in Ohio and still live in Ohio, you know, has a job in Ohio. But uh, the hope is that if the biblical message penetrates, uh, such a person will realize that, you know, apart 
from fellowship with God through the Messiah, uh, I'm in exile. Uh, and in a greater way, not just separated from God, but of course, we're not in the Garden of Eden. We're not in paradise anymore. And this is really what the whole Bible story is about. Salvation is is described in terms of being brought back to God, but also to the place where humanity can dwell with God face to face. And so I find it really fascinating that when God says, well, I'm going to bless the nations through the seed of Abraham, uh, Israel, who has the, the vocation of spreading God's glory among the nations, they end up in the same predicament as the nations. So by the end of Genesis, they're there in Egypt, the beginning of Exodus, you have Israel in exile. And so the way that God orchestrated humanity, he's, or excuse me, orchestrated history is, is the remedy for the nations is being put on stage as Israel is brought out of exile and into the land. You know, it's that, that serves to demonstrate for the nations that although you are in exile away from God outside of the land of Eden, you know, God has a plan for your salvation as well. What do you think there is about, gosh, I don't want to make this too too loaded of a question, but just to, just what you said, again, this, this exilic consciousness, that's not typically the way we're taught in church to think about Israel. It's not typically the way that even Jews think about Israel. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's very atypical, but it's very transparent when you start looking at some of these themes where the main characters, you know, the, the family God wants is continually estranged. Mm -hmm. And there's this distancing that's created. It's very, it's very palpable. How in the world do we miss that? I mean, what, what is it about the way we teach Old Testament or the way we approach you know, Old Testament Israel, the Old Testament story? How do we how do we not get this? How is it not more intuitive? You know, I I really think that it's the absence of the Old Testament in at least Western evangelicalism that uh, has a large burden to bear uh, for this ignorance. You know, we come from an era where you just hand out the New Testament, maybe with the Psalms in the back. Right. Uh, and and I think that the church is just really anemic. I mean, we the church is like a tree and the trunk is the Torah. And right now the church looks like a lollipop. You know, the trunk is just so thin and emaciated. Yeah. So I, I think that's part of it is uh, we, we we're just not emphasizing even canonically the the the, the foundational role of the Torah. I mean, this is something that I'm thinking about all the time and doing biblical theology. I, I've realized over the past few years, you know, I need to emphasize Deuteronomy more. Deuteronomy gives us the, the whole goal of a society of justice, uh, living with God in the land that, that we see at the end of the Bible. But that gets missed when evangelicalism is, is shallow and it's just, as I said before, where you need your sins forgiven, you make a decision, and that's it. I do think biblical literature uh, partakes of that genre of exilic literature. It, it's it's like a lot of, I mean, obviously it's God's word, but yeah, you can't miss it once you see it, it. There it is again. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And this, you know, it's becoming more and more popular popular uh, in recent decades to approach the New Testament this way. Even though Israelites were in the land, there's a, a great sense where they understood, if we can judge rightly by the intertestamental literature, that they understood they were still in spiritual exile, which mm -hmm. is precisely, you know, how, where the New Testament comes in to meet that need, that um, the people are in the land, but they haven't yet experienced the great exodus that the prophets foretold. Well, it, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, yesterday I was reading a little something on uh, Mashiach, uh, some of the, some Messiah terminology, and um, you know it was one of Old Father Fitzmyer's uh, book essays in his book, the the one who is is to come, and um, he just made the simple observation that as time went on, the Mashiach was a title that was began to be transferred to the high priest because he didn't have a king, <laughs> so mm -hmm. obviously, you know, and you think that, that, I mean, how many times? have you thought about Israel and not had that specific thought, but it's so telling because there they are. Oh yeah, we're in the land. All right. Kingless. 
<laughs> we right. have to, we are, our, our, our big authority figure is, is this guy that this language, the, the language of anointing isn't really supposed to be this, this guy anyway. He's a stand in, he's a placeholder, he's a substitute. So even, even that gives you a sense of exile. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something as simple as that, but, but yet we don't sort of stop and, and pick up on it. And, and right there it is in front of our faces. You know, every, you, I mean, how can you read through the Gospels and Acts without come, running into the high priest? Right. You know, it, you know the Lord's anointed and gets transferred to, you know, that, all that, that, that jargon. And it, it's still proof of exile. <laughs> That's right. You, you, can't, you can't get away from it. Well, that, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just it. thinking Jesus captures that, well, of course, with the prodigal son. And and that's a story that you know touches everyone's hearts. And but again, failing to see that that's really the story of the Bible, that yeah. we are in exile and uh, God brings us home to Himself. And 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 part of the other side of that is that again, the church in the West, uh, you know, looks like things are changing. But for so long, I think we the church has just been at home in the world. And I think that yeah. kind of True. gives you those blinders to realizing that, no, you know, Hebrews 11, we're, we're strangers and pilgrims. We're, we're still in exile uh, until the resurrection into the new earth. Well, that, that's good preaching, because, I mean, look, look at the way the church wants to use the, the trappings of power on the secular side to accomplish its mission. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a dereliction of duty, mm -hmm. but it, it's so unconscious now that we've adapted so well to being this secondary thing, you know, government and, and political power and these, these sorts of things that are, that are part of the world and, and we're very comfortable with them. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you hit the nail right, right on the head there. It, when, when you transition from that intro to part one, which it would, for the listener is chapters two through seven, the book concerns the historical exodus of Israel from Egypt, of course, which we covered a lot in the podcast series. But generally, and you don't have to, to go too deeply into this, but generally, how important do you think the historicity of the exodus is for doing biblical theology? That's a, a complex question in the sense that uh, I think the historicity is important. But when you add for doing biblical theology, part of what makes it difficult is the biblical theology is an ever changing discipline. Um, you know, in the early, late 19th, early 20th century, biblical theology, what went under that name was basically um, the history of religions. And so historicity mattered a lot. But biblical theology now really has become a literary and exegetical discipline. And so to one degree, I, you know, and I've read guys who say, you know, they'll do great biblical theology and, and, and you know, these truths we can embrace even if, um, you know, these stories aren't historical in the sense that it's textual. Uh, however, depending on how much weight we put into theology, part of biblical theology, sure. uh, you know, it's these truths about God are anchored in the fact that his word is true and that what he is saying he has done and will do is true. And so for my part, uh, I, I think that true biblical theology, where we, we get a true theology, um, does demand historicity. And of course, according to, to genre, you know, depending on... Uh, his, historicity is one of those things that, that professional historians can get away with quite a bit without their audience ever even knowing it. Uh, I, I have this, this sort of pet lecture I give about where I challenge the historian to write, to write the story of their own wedding. Hmm. And of course, you probe it for external sources. Did anyone record the conversations? How many different perspectives have we included here? I mean, you go, you just go right down the, the grocery list to the way we quote unquote do history, and nothing that that person's going to give to me is going to be considered reliable. And let's not even get into God talk. Right. That's so okay. True. And 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 that that's the reality, though. We we it's a kind of sophistry when when you get right down to it that. We we tend to um, view ourselves as these professional pursuers of of this particular discipline, when the result is that nothing we say can be taken at face value. <laughs> right. 
Right. You know, and then, and then we're stuck, you know, and, and we're supposed to live in this and 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 appreciate how enlightened we are, and and we are completely non-communicative at that point. So I think there's a bit of sophistry with this. I'm I'm on your side of this, obviously, um, with historicity, but I think historicity has become sort of a cloak. Um, you know, right. There are things you can hide behind it, and things that you don't want to hide behind it, and it's a it's a bit of a cat and a mouse kind of thing. Which you know, it takes a good scholar to do that. You know, that's what scholars are for. They 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 can sometimes take clear things and muddle them. <laughs> <laughs> for the benefit of all i guess <laughs> uh anyway i just i just wanted to to, to work that in because we did spend a, a good bit of time uh in this podcast on you know historical issues tracking through exodus and it, it is important and I, I like the way you put it you know that these are truth claims so it would be nice to know that they're true or right. at least at least you know a, a, attempt to you know, approach it from that perspective. In in chapter two, you talk about the Exodus prefigured. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so there I'm dealing primarily with the life of Abraham, and I just really needed to limit myself. The IVP was gracious to extend my, my word count, so my volume is <laughs> slightly thicker than um, at least the first volume in that series. And that was constantly um, the great dilemma that I face is this theme is so pervasive. So how on earth can I cover it adequately? And I'm not a big fan of broad brushstrokes, you know, covering the Pentateuch like in 15 pages. Uh, so I, I always <laughs> err on, you know, for you. <laughs> taking just sort of a little section and try to show some of its layers and depths. And so I said, well, let me focus on Abraham and I was just uh, amazed from beginning to end of Abraham's life. You just have yeah. Exodus themes and, and motifs. I mean, one great example, Genesis 15, 7, where uh, God says, I am Yahweh, uh, who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldees. Mm -hmm. And this is the great Exodus formula we're familiar with from Exodus 20, verse 2. You know, I am Yahweh, who brought you out yeah. of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And um, But then... As soon as Abraham's in the land, there's, there's a famine, and he goes down to Egypt. And uh, lo and behold, God brings him out by plaguing the Pharaoh with plagues. And, and uh, Abraham ends up bringing uh, many spoils out of Egypt. You have the entire pattern there that Israel's going to follow. You know, there's a rabbinical saying that says that everything that happened to the Israelites first happened to the fathers, the patriarchs. And, and that was proven over and over again, as I looked at the life of, of Abraham, you know, the, the great climactic point in his life, the Akedar, the, the binding or near sacrifice of Isaac, it's just shot through with Passover themes. Here you have um, the firstborn son through Sarah, who yep. is in danger of death, and, and God um, says that he'll provide a lamb. I mean, that's the great hope of Abraham, so that his son will be spared. In fact, um, the book of Jubilees I think that was written around the second century BC. Actually, it's a commentary on Genesis, the early chapters of Exodus. It actually dates the Akedah to Passover. Uh, it, there's a sense where it was the first Passover. Yeah, it's incredible. Wow. I, yeah, I didn't, you know, I spent a little bit of time in, in Jubilees, mostly for the demonic stuff. So I, I was going to <laughs> get the good stuff, you know. Um, but I was not aware of that, but that's actually really interesting. Can you give us a bird's eye view of chapters three through six? Because I think for this audience, they're going to pick up right away what you're doing here. So we're the, the Torah itself tell, tells us we're in exile. I mean, we, you're just out of the gate. You get these themes that are associated with the first Exodus. It, it naturally is going to sort of you know stoke the reader for a, these second Exodus themes. But how do you how do you sort of in in those chapters three through six and the rest of part one? How do you set that up? So I, knowing that the historical exodus would be sort of the foundation for the prophesied exodus, uh, I really thought about what, what are four major themes. And so it's worth clarifying that, that the book is not about the book of Exodus, you know, mm -hmm. chapter 1 through 40, but, but the pattern of Exodus proper, which is chapters 1 through 15. And so uh, in chapter 3, uh, which is entitled something like Glory to God in the Highest, 
given that one of the major goals of the Exodus is to publish the glory of Yahweh. And it's this is crucial. Often when we think of Exodus, we think of themes like liberty and freedom, which are certainly there, but they're not the priority. I mean, if if that was the Lord's major goal, then of, he would have softened Pharaoh's heart instead of hardened him. Uh, but God wanted to display his glory, and so he actually confirms Pharaoh in his own rebellion. It, it's sort of like watching uh, boxing, you know, a three-second knockout. You don't really get to see all of the uh, the glory of, of the boxer, so to speak, because, you know, his opponent was just too weak. And so God has to uphold Pharaoh so that he can uh, turn that that proverbial gem and and let Israel and Egypt and really the nations see who he is. And and I try to develop, you know, the discussion, why was this so necessary? You know, we forget this is a world without scripture. And talking about Genesis and that steady exile away from the presence of God also leads to an ignorance of God. And so God is going to orchestrate this deliverance that will publish his name among the nations. And that means that even Israel's suffering needed to be prolonged for a little bit for their own greater good. So then they would have stories by the fireside to tell their grandchildren, great-grandchildren about the wonders and glories of God. And so the chapter culminates with the way that the Exodus culminates in Exodus 15 with the Song of the Sea. And, And Israel declares, who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? And that was really the point of the way that God delivered his people. And, and we find out later, um, you know, Jethro and Moses telling his father and all that God had done, he praises God and says, surely he is, you know, king above all the gods, and, and he offers sacrifice. We'll find in Joshua, even a harlot in Canaan, in, you know, in Jericho, mm-hmm. has heard about the wonders of the Lord and makes a profession of faith, marries into the line of Judah and becomes an ancestress of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, that was the great goal, and I try to position that from the beginning. The second chapter uh, talks about slaying the dragon, and I had fun with, with that one. I basically was looking at some of these themes we find throughout Scripture. Egypt is, is something like a theological sheol. You always descend to go down. You know, you go down into Egypt. Yeah. It's the place of the dead. Uh, so the Israelites, you know, very sarcastically in chapter 14 are saying, is it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? Uh, and I try to bring out some uh, structural uh, features like, uh, you know, Moses' deliverance from water, the waters in Exodus 2, yep. and, and Israel yep. in 14. So it's almost like Egypt is surrounded by waters. To escape Egypt, you have to get out of Sheol. Uh, but I also lean on Exodus 29, where Pharaoh is specifically likened to a dragon um, fouling uh, his waters. He's, he's waiting in the Nile. And, and so I look at some examples in the actual book of Exodus, even though, as we were saying before, it's historical narrative, yet it's theologically oriented. And there's a few occasions where some scholars, and I would agree with them, see that Pharaoh is being depicted as a dragon. Uh, we also have the, the first yep. sign given to Moses with the rod turning into a serpent, and, and Aaron does that as well. And yeah, Leviathan, the cosmic Leviathan figure. Our audience is gonna is gonna enjoy that. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I forget I'm talking you know to the choir here, so I don't really have to <laughs> do a lot of explaining. But um, oh, no, we all know what Leviathan is here. <laughs> sweet. So yes, that that's basically what I'm trying to show is happening, and and so then the Exodus story is positioned within that broad biblical story where the Messiah is gonna slay the serpent, the dragon of old. You know, which begins all the way in Eden and continues into the book of Revelation. So that was um, chapter four. The fifth chapter is on the Passover, and that's also very key. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Because without the Passover, the Exodus just becomes political liberation. It's not really redemption. And th- through the Passover, the Exodus actually becomes deliverance from death. Uh, so you have the, the threat of death and the firstborn son who, in a sense, represents the, the whole household. And the whole household partakes of the lamb that is the substitute for the son. They, they get delivered through the son. 
so that it's not just, hey, we were set free by Pharaoh, but no, we were delivered from death. And the key is we can only be delivered from death through the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. And so it, when we look at Israel, whom God refers to as my firstborn son, I think it's in Exodus chapter 4, then we can say that the story of the Exodus is God delivering his firstborn son from death. And that's got a lot of theological weight, of course, already have you know an eye toward the New Testament section. Uh, yep. but this, this is a way to show that it, it's actually there in the Pentateuch and the New Testament fulfillment truly is a flowering and, and fulfillment of uh, these concepts. It's amazing how, how you get both the individual and the corporate sonship mm -hmm. just, just tied right back in there. And again, you know, I asked earlier, we're not, we, we're not going to rehearse it again, but how do, we, how do we not, how do people in our churches not intuitively have a feel for this? Because again, once you, you see it, and, and and you just all you really have to do is know the stories. You don't have to go out and get degrees and do Hebrew word studies and and all this. You, you, if you just know the stories, you know God in His wisdom, you know makes so much of this trackable in in such a such a a, a human way as something as simple as telling a story. It's just there. You know, one, right. one, once you know the story, you'll you'll see where the story is being repurposed elsewhere. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing that the, the gospel authors, these images and motifs come up time and again. And, and even the early church, I love so much of the, the, the beautiful language and mind of, of so many of the early church fathers where they'll talk about baptism as re-entry into paradise. And, and it, it seems like the, the ancient Eastern culture just embraced a lot of uh, these figures intuitively, mm -hmm. and of, of course they're in Scripture, and so you know I don't know if it's a straw man to you know to talk about you know rationalism and, and all of that and Aristotelianism, and but we have really we're so influenced I, I do think by the Greek mentality that everything is syllogisms and the Bible you know it, it's narrative art it, it's a uh, story yeah. and I'm but not you know we teach it that's the way we teach it we teach it like we're preparing for a quiz right. Right. Yeah. And I'm not in any way denigrating, you know, systematic theology. I, I, I love both. But I think to, to some degree, um, when we can get things sort of just written out as principles, we we lose some of the beauty and ability of, of reading narrative, especially uh, which historically it seems like the church was able to do. Right. Yeah, I think personally, I think this is why things like I'm, I'm a friend of Tim Mackey's, but over at the Bible Project, I think this is the key to their success to to restore the, mm -hmm. the story approach. I, it's it's intuitive, it's 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 purposeful, it's you know frankly it's biblical, you know to present you know truth this way because it happens so many places, and they've just more or less gone back to that that simple thing with the skill set they have. And I mean, look, look at all the good stuff that, you know, has been turned out, you know, that really helps you know, the audience in this generation. I mean, it helps me too. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not in the, uh, whatever the age group is now I'm a boomer. So I'm still stuck in the, in the mud back in 1963. I was, I was born on the, on the, that cuff year. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I get, I get it from both sides, you know, but uh, I, I think that's, that's really why, their their impact is what it is, and that that ministry has exploded. I, I didn't know when I wrote Unseen Realm, but I, I I didn't realize I was doing the same thing mm -hmm. until I sort of could see it from the other side and and got a little. I'm I'm not a literary guy by by nature. I'm a I'm a nuts and bolts guy, but I love I love literary guys like you and Tim are really strong here, which is why I tend to gravitate and Seth. You know, I, I gravitate toward those things because. I love the interconnectivity of it all. I'll be, I'll be the one who's, you know, working in the in, in the weeds, you know, for 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 this or that. But it's like just show me the connections, and it, it's so it's so intelligent on God's part. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this way, it's so much better. Oh man. Um, the chapter seven, of course, reminded me a, a lot of your work on Leviticus. Which again, this audience knows. So you 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 title this one "Cultic Exodus." So summarize "Cultic Exodus" for us. And again, this audience will know that refers to ritual, right? 
you know, sacrificial system and whatnot. It's good. It's good to to clarify. I do find um, readers of the Leviticus book um, they're used to the word cult only for you know these, <laughs> these aberrant groups where you know you have no cult, <laughs> right? So yeah, it, just referring to the sacrificial system and trying to show that. In Israel's sacrificial system, the ritual, the, you have this Exodus movement, and I'm really banking on it. I embrace that there's primarily two movements in Scripture. It's, it's exile and Exodus, either being driven away uh, from mm-hmm. God or brought to him. And so in one sense, any approach to God is, is like an Exodus, but I do think it goes beyond that with the ritual system. So I, I cover very um, broadly the threefold liturgy of of Israel, which moves from the purification offering uh, to the whole burnt offering, then then to the peace offering. You can see that triad, for example, Leviticus 9, the inaugural worship ceremony at at the tabernacle. Uh, The whole burnt offering always comes with the grain or the tribute offering, so I just include that. Uh, So basically it's the three. And the purification offering emphasizes the blood and the expiation necessary through the shedding of blood. The whole burnt offering you know, you're really looking at that column of smoke ascending to heaven. We read in the flood narrative that, that the Lord smelled that soothing aroma. And that, that phrase, soothing aroma, will be all over Leviticus. It, it basically is the picture of atonement, of propitiation, of, of God's wrath being satisfied. Um, but the Holbert offering, the name uh, Ola, the ascending one, points us to that column of smoke, but it's also the, the offering where the entire animal, apart from its skin, is placed on the altar. So it has the idea of consecration. So we're, we're moving from expiation to consecration. And then the peace offering is under that rubric of offerings where the, the worshiper actually got to partake of some of the meat himself. And typically it was um, like a sacramental meal where your whole family and you, you know, according to Deuteronomy, invite the Levite and, and the indigent uh, to celebrate a meal in the presence of God. So the movement is from expiation to consecration to fellowship, and it really does follow uh, the movement of the Exodus pattern, where to be released from Egypt, we have all of this emphasis on the blood of the mm-hmm. Lamb, and yeah. then they're brought to Sinai, where they're consecrated in covenant. Um, and, you know, by representation, you know, the elders ascend uh, to God and, and have this fellowship meal where they see God and, and are not put to death. Um, or you can extend, you know, the, the, the peace offering to the third great movement, which is being brought into the land of Canaan, where they, they are living in the land before the face of God. And you know, Deuteronomy describes just the joyous uh, life in, in God's presence there. So that threefold movement is experienced and re-experienced through worship. And and I think it's the same uh, for God's people today. Uh, There's a sense where every time we approach God, that we are experiencing our exodus, you know, we're coming out of the world, we're we're approaching the heavenly Zion. And there's a way that um, good liturgy can, can, can emphasize that journey to God. Yeah. Now, when, when you, uh, yes, it, your, your book obviously has a table of contents, and, and you, I'm going to loop that into the liturgy comment that you just made, because it's very apparent if we were sitting here, you know, looking through the, 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 the TOC of the book, I mean, you've you've got all these patterns established by the time you hit part two, and that's the more familiar Old Testament stuff, as, as slim as that can be in our in our churches, unfortunately. Um, where you move next is the, the you know, the, the prophets, the historical books and the prophets, which you get even, uh, you know, less attention, but the patternings are still there. So in part two, you know, you have the, the initial chapter there, chapter eight, it's going to be chapters eight through 11 for that whole part, but the pattern of sacred history, I'd like you to, to talk about how the Exodus stories and, and some of this the, the liturgical imagery that you're talking about. Obviously, your goal here is to see how that echoes through or reverberates through other parts of the Old Testament. So can you give us a few examples of that? Sure. Well, um, in chapter eight, as you mentioned, the pattern of sacred history, I really developed the idea by, um, I want to say it was a mid-20th century 
uh, Anglican by the name of uh, William Fithian, Fithian Adams. And although I wouldn't agree with him on, him on everything, he had great biblical theology, and he basically said, you know, it comes down to this threefold pattern, redemption, consecration, inheritance. Redemption out of Egypt, consecration at Sinai, inheritance of the land, life, life with God in the land. And that fit a lot of the work I had already done for my dissertation, and, and so it, it rang true. And the beauty of that simple historical, redemptive historical pattern is that it, it really enables us to grasp the history of Israel uh, and even into the church today. And so in and the, one article, the already but not yet is right there. Yes. It's right there on the surface. So in one of his articles, Stephen Adams says, you know, all the prophets do is say, you know, look, because of your sins, breaking faith with the Lord, committing idolatry, and then refusing to repent prophet after prophet, God is going to send you into exile, which means we're going back to the beginning of the book of Exodus. So, you know, we have a first redemption, a first consecration, a first inheritance uh, from our first exile. Uh, and that was, again, what we see in the Torah. But the prophets um, using this, this rubric uh, are also, and I think also based on Deuteronomy 30 and, of course, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying when you're in exile, God is going to renew this sacred pattern of history. There's going to be a new redemption, a new exodus, which is going to lead to a new consecration, a new covenant. And in one sense, you just add new to everything. A new exodus will lead to a new covenant, yep. you know, and that language is even used by Jeremiah, a new covenant, and it's going to lead to a new inheritance where the prophet's saying, this time you'll never be plucked out because the redemption will be so thoroughgoing. You know, the the second exodus will be so much greater than the first that it will solve the problem. Because otherwise, if we just have another exodus, it's okay, well, we're going to end up in exile again, and this is going to go on ad infinitum. But God is going to deal definitively with the root problem, uh, sin. And so, you know, the redemption, the Passover is going to be an atonement that actually cleanses completely, and we're going to be given the, the greater outpouring of the Spirit that will cause us to rejoice in the law and to walk in the way of the Lord. And when we're finally brought into the inheritance, it'll be forever. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but the prophets, uh, and this is something that I, that I tried to develop in, I think it's the, the ninth chapter, not even sure right now, but this is really important. In fact, for New Testament biblical theology, when I teach that, we actually, we take the first half of the semester, and it's basically a prophet's course, because It'd be very easy to, you know, you go to the Gospel of Matthew, for example, and then look for Exodus motifs, which sure. means basically you'd be looking at Exodus and Numbers, maybe Deuteronomy. And that's all there. So we see Jesus and New Moses and things like that. But the problem with that is that when the prophets prophesy a second Exodus, they're actually adding motifs to the original Exodus. In other words, there's a lot of things we miss that the gospel writers are doing if we don't look at the prophesied second exodus mm -hmm. as its own block of material. So mm -hmm. you know, one of the big ones is that the new Moses um, is going to unite the southern and northern kingdoms. Um, and, mm -hmm. and Luke Luke is showing that specifically in the book of Acts, that Jesus is doing this. Um, but if you don't even realize anymore that's an expectation for the new exodus, then, then you won't even see the wonder of what Luke is expressing. Another motif is, is that the new Moses will actually be a new David. Uh, so in Matthew's gospel, it's no wonder, you know, many commentators you look and it's all about David, David, David. Then you get some others like Allison and no, it's the new Moses. Well, they're both right. Um, the yeah. new Moses is the new David. And then, of course, there's the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is, is one of those uh, motifs as well. And so I'm trying in that section of this book to say um, these are motifs that we need to add to the historical Exodus motif. And so I treat, even though scholars vary, and I just make the distinction to make it for my own purposes, the historical Exodus out of Egypt um, is the Torah. The prophesied second exodus is the prophetic corpus. And then when I get to the New Testament, it's called the new exodus. Mm -hmm. And the new exodus will then encompass motifs from the second exodus prophesied, but also from the historical. So that's a lot of the ground that I, I try to cover uh, in that section.
Yeah, and I, I'm hoping listeners again are, are picking up on this. If you're a Jew living in Jesus' day, and you're you're a literate Jew, okay, you you you're familiar with the content of of your Old Testament, okay, your your Hebrew Bible or the Septuagint, you're familiar with the the, the sacred texts of, of your your faith, your belief system. It is it should not be a hard sell to say things like they still believe they were in exile. They're expecting deliverance. They're not, they're not on the other side of deliverance where we're just waiting to be happy or, or happier than we were yesterday or something like that. We're going to go off and you know, live our best life now or something like that. I mean, they're, 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 not, they're not sitting around thinking these thoughts. There are significant things that need to happen for God to get what he wants. You know what what he's always wanted. You know, go all the way back to what does God want? It's you know God wants a people. He wants a family. It's not it's not terribly overcomplicated. And you go through all these steps, and they still don't they don't have what God wants, and they they don't have what what they're going to want. You know, because they're designed by God to want it. You know, all these things. There, there's a lack there that, that that if you're a Jew, you're not thinking you're on the other side of deliverance. Right. You're just not. There, there are just so many of these things that have to, these holes that have to be filled. And so in, in the book, when you, you loop around through part two, you get to chapter nine, and, and this is the, even in the exile itself, you know, what we think of as the exile and the return, there's, they still have this consciousness. They're still expecting a second exodus. So talk a little bit about that, some of the, this, this latter material, like, you know, with, without getting into theories of authorship and, and you know, Isaiah's and all this sort of thing. Um, but the, the latter portions of Isaiah having, you know, the kind of the, the, the grander culminating vision, um, how, does, how does that work? How does that sort of reinforce for a Jew a sense of exile by the time that, that Jesus of Nazareth is going to show up? Yeah, I think— um... Not only Isaiah, so many of the prophets, when they talk Ezekiel. about, yeah, when they talk about the return, you know, there's almost this idea where you, when you return to the land, it's going to be like Eden. It's going to be like paradise. You know, there's going to be a Davidic king. The nations will be streaming. You know, we see that particular uh, vision in Isaiah. You know, Isaiah two is sort of uh, those early chapters gives the summary of the whole book. Um, Mount Zion is established above the mountains. The nations are streaming there. You have all these messianic um, prophecies in the early part. And so when we think about the return from Babylon and you read those post-exilic prophets, I mean, that is enough, I think, to get to the point where you're saying, well, yeah, by the New Testament, it's, we're still waiting because they yeah. come to an arid land. They're, they're suffering. You know, there's a locust plague. There's a drought. Um, the people are so weary. They're not even worried about building the temple anymore. God has to raise up, you know, um, prophets to, you know, Haggai. You know, let, let's move on with God's house. Uh, and then it's clear in the literature of Ezra and Nehemiah that the people are falling into the same sins. I mean, that's what they say. This is why your yeah. fathers were exiled. Uh, but I really lean a lot on the book of Daniel. I mean, Daniel here you have Daniel, who's reading the prophecies from Jeremiah, who says, after 70 years, we're going to have the restoration. And, and God sends the angel Gabriel to him and says, yes, but no, you know, they're, yet you're first already, not yet. You know, God's people will return, but all of those expectations is not 70 years, but 70 weeks of years. Um, you got to push back. And in fact, the big, the hard message of Daniel is your great, great grandchildren are going to be under foreign powers. You, mm -hmm. Your MO is to bring up the next generation um, to be willing to even die for their faith and to be willing to endure hardship before these seasons of refreshing come. So I find it fascinating. It's the same Gabriel that then is sent, you know, in Luke's gospel to announce, well, the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. But then Jesus, through all his parables, does something very similar to the message of Daniel. He says already, but not yet. The kingdom of God, as we're expecting it, um, you know, with the political might and, and glory and the restoration, all of that is going to be put off a bit further. Um, now is the time, you know, for the spiritual exodus. And so 
but other features that make it clear, you know, and I, I try to deal sensitively with this in the book, but also when I'm there, teaching. There's so students. much of it, you know, there's so much of it. You have to be selective. Right? You don't want to falter at extremes. So you'll have some that just say, well, basically the restoration, you know, the people back to them means nothing. Well, no, we, we want to acknowledge that God's good hand was upon his people. Well, at the same time saying this was nothing close to what the prophets prophesied. I mean, you know, this is why in an earlier chapter I emphasized that the second act will be so much greater. Clearly, historically, uh, the return from Babylon was much less uh, uh, a work as far as number of people that returned to the land. You have these other, you know, sine qua nones. There's no Davidic king reigning on the throne. There's no atonement has been made. There's no outpouring yeah. of the spirit. So all of these things foster longing. And I think that um, getting back to Isaiah, he's dealing with that. And, you know, beginning in chapters 40, where you have these suffering servant passages, you have this figure that is sort of taking on the mantle of Israel's vocation. Um, And clearly it's not the nation of Israel itself, because part of his goal is to bring Israel, uh, you know, Jacob back, back to God. And of course, you know, we, we get uh, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, where we just have these brutally vivid um, scenes of the servant suffering, uh, taking on the sins of his people upon himself. And, and then suddenly after that, you have this great invitation to God's salvation. Uh, it's amazing, but it's preceded by these Exodus motifs, and then it's followed by an invitation to salvation. So clearly, this suffering servant has accomplished the spiritual redemption, the spiritual exodus that then leads eventually to the new heavens and the new earth, um, with which the book of Isaiah ends. And yeah, um, you, you never lose either side of it, either the individual or the corporate side of it. Right. You know, that, that Again, that becomes window dressing for people who want to resist you know, things like, you know, biblical prophecy in terms of an, an individual redeemer. But, it, you know, that's cheating. They're both there. <laughs> right, because you don't, you his followers will be called servants. And I think Luke has this in mind in the book of Acts. The disciples of the Messiah are servants under the servant, and they're carrying on that vocation of, of bringing uh, the Lord's salvation to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Now, in part three, you you get into the New Testament and new Exodus themes, and there's so much here. I I, I want to ask you really our final two questions um, would be using the Gospel of John. Let, let's talk about how how John communicates new Exodus themes, and then specifically in chapter 13, you devote a, a chapter to the Holy Spirit's role in the new Exodus. So let's take those one at a time. Give us give us some indications of how the Gospel of John communicates the New Exodus. Wow, <laughs> there's no way I can do it justice. I'm not sure that I did in the book, but I tried. It it uh, is so rich. But but one idea to point out are the bookends. What I, I would refer to as Passover bookends in the Gospel of John. So uh, in chapter one, verse 29 and 36, Jesus is introduced into his public ministry by John the the baptizer with the words, behold, the Lamb of God. And there's, you know, there's debate among scholars, what does that refer to? And I think there's a lot of false either or thinking along the way. But the the leading um, answer to the question would be the Passover Lamb. And then we have in chapter 19, when uh, Christ is crucified, John alone of the four gospel writers gives us this incident where Jesus's legs were not broken because he had already died. And he tells us that it's to fulfill uh, scripture that not one of his legs, not one of his bones should be broken, which ultimately brings us back to that Passover legislation. So when Jesus is introduced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you know, that's putting a label on him literarily. And and Mm -hmm. so throughout the rest of the gospel, he's Lamb of God. So it becomes natural then when we see his crucifixion and not one of this lamb's bones were broken to think about the Exodus. But but John is doing many uh, more um, just richly conceived things. He's the only gospel writer that that refers to the garden near the end of Jesus' life. I mean, 
the garden is, big deal. Yeah, he's the only one that used. I think Luke uses it once in a parable. Besides that, it's never the word is never used again in the New Testament. And especially for the resurrection of Jesus, it's like the Garden of Eden. Uh, the woman mistakes him for the farmer. We're, we're back to Adam and the woman in the garden. Yeah. And, and so I think he's showing us, you know, the crucifixion was the Passover release from Sheol. And he eventually emerges out of the tomb and he's back in paradise. So he, he's not only giving us the story of Israel, but he's giving us the story of humanity. And after all, Jesus, before the crucifixion, is pointed out by Pilate as, behold the man. Um, so he's, he's showing us the reversal of exile that we begin the Bible with. Through sin, uh, humanity mm-hmm. was separated from God, um, exiled out of Eden. And so he's showing us that this new exodus, it's spiritual, but it's it's what ultimately will enable those who embrace the Messiah to find themselves back in the Garden of Eden. And spiritually, we are restored to paradise uh, as we're restored to God. And so the Passover theme is is just really richly developed in, in the Gospel of John. And, and, and those are just some examples. And I, I hope the audience, you know, was tuned in just for those last few minutes, because I mean, we've done episodes like we did an episode on Jesus and the gardener you know, garden motifs with kings and, and so on and so forth. But but here it's even more subtle. It's even how the, in these examples, how the gospel itself was written, what, how it's arranged. I mean, you, if, if we have a goal on this podcast, it's it's that you would, you would learn to read your Bible and not take anything in it for granted. In other words, you're, there's messaging there. Nothing is supposed to be considered in isolation. Uh, it's it's too intelligent for that, and and here you 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 get this this retelling of the exile story, the and, and the deliverance from exile, just even in how John decides to arrange material and again un, under providence, of course. Yeah, what's so, so beautiful? This is great about just John's brilliance, and again, yes, under the Spirit's inspiration, but the way he interweaves the books of Genesis and Exodus together so that ultimately the new Exodus is out of the old creation into the new. And so he begins his gospel with, in the beginning, and then from the cross, it is finished, which brings us to the end of creation and his yeah. emergence out of the tomb <laughs> into the new creation. I mean, it is it is so... Uh, where have just, we seen, where have we run into these phrases before? I mean, this should be the constant question of, of of the reader of the Bible. Where have I seen a phrase like this before? Where have I seen the, this wording before? Where have I seen this event, this institution, this person? This It just gets repurposed with such regularity. Mm-hmm. Again, just to, designed to, to, to teach these things. That, I mean, honestly, look, if, if, if we could read Scripture like that, we would get so much more out of it. This is why I'm, I'm always harping on we should read the Bible as though it were as though it were a novel, as though it were fiction, because we we just, our senses are tuned to know that fiction writers do things to us on purpose. Right. When we don't, we don't read a textbook that way, you know, we're looking for the bullet points for the quiz or something like that. But we know if it's fiction, it's all, there's, there's nothing that just happens. Yeah, that's it's true. Fiction. Yeah, I think that is, I mean, you've really caught, I think the gist of the problem is, we we approach the Bible like a textbook or or like a newspaper, and and probably that arose out of good reasons because we know that sure. it's giving us true history. But we we lost the literary aspect, so we're not even looking. And I think that's that's really part of the solution. I found once people learn that the Bible is doing things like this, and suddenly their mindset changes. They're reading with a new expectation, and they're they're starting to see, you know, the glories of God's word um, afresh on their own. They, they just need to be shown, yeah, uh, yeah the, the the genre of the Bible. Well, let, well, let's let's leave off with the Holy Spirit. How about the Holy Spirit's role in the New Exodus? What, what are the tu- some of the touch points with the the first Exodus? Yeah, I'll say that that might. Be my favorite chapter. I enjoyed so meditating on uh, these concepts and and just going back to scripture with this idea. I, I took my lead again from the the prophet Isaiah, just simply because again I had to limit myself. Mm-hmm. And Isaiah, as part of the, the New Exodus, you know, this is another motif that you constantly see the the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. 
But Isaiah does it in an amazing way. He, he uses the imagery of a barren land that needs water. And when the water falls on the land, it turns into the Garden of Eden. Uh, and then Isaiah will show us that that also represents God's people. They're dry and thirsty spiritually, but when God pours out his spirit upon them, they'll be renewed and recreated. And I think that John has this in mind in a beautiful way. I mean, the gospel after the prologue begins in the wilderness with the voice in the wilderness. And what does that voice declare? It declares that this Lamb of God is going to be the one who baptizes with the Spirit. And as we've already seen, the gospel ends back in the Garden of Eden. So you, you track that trajectory from the wilderness to the Garden of Eden, and, and part of the key is the gift of the Spirit. And so if you just have that in mind and through the gospel, you'll see that scene by scene, this is the underlying um, issue. This is the emphasis. So when Jesus meets with the woman at the well, He's talking about water that he'll give her. She'll never thirst again. And there's that Isaiah motif. And even from the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. Uh, this clearly goes back to Isaiah. Also, the Feast of Tabernacles. Anyone who, who thirsts, you know, come unto me. And out of his heart, you know, abundant waters will flow. So this is something that John is developing uh, step by step. And, and talking about uh, Genesis, you know, at the end where he breathes on the disciples, the spirit that's taking us to Genesis. Is this, why, is this, is this what, you, do you use that to lead up to the resurrection material in the book that, that you end with? Is that correct? Yes. And, and, and there I, you know, when you're working with John, there, there's always this temptation. Well, is that really what he said? But when you go to the book of Revelation, which is weird because Revelation is the apocalypse and we think it's got more confusing imagery, but he's actually, you know, he puts his cards on the table. At the end of Revelation, there's yeah. the tree of life, Garden of Eden, the river's flowing, and, and then you have the same invitation Jesus Guess gives. Guess where we're going. <laughs> yeah, come, and, come and drink. And that's how he's ending theologically and spiritually the, the gospel of, of John, but at the very basic foundational point for the Holy Spirit. And again, Jesus teaches this in the Upper Room Discourse. He, he dedicates three chapters. It's so important. In terms of the new Exodus, you know, Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's the Exodus, the emergence out of the tomb as a new creation. Well, that's great for Jesus, but what does it do for us? And this is where theologically the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit unites us to Christ. And this is why you have all of this beautiful teaching in John's Gospel about union with Christ. Because when we're united to his death, burial, and resurrection, then that means we undergo spiritually at first the three-day resurrection, and our great hope is for the consummate exodus, when we emerge out of our own graves and are ushered into the new Jerusalem. Well, I'm just thrilled that we were able to have you on the podcast because the, the, the new exodus idea, or I, it's actually a set of ideas, is, is pretty clear. Uh, from this is really uh, significant. Anything we can do to become more intelligent readers of Scripture, that we ought to go into it knowing that not only each individual author had had a plan, they had a purpose, lots of you know, different purposes and strategies, trajectories to communicate their ideas to us intentionally. They're doing things to us on purpose, and and to to not let go of that sense, but to to read with it and to expect. Um, that we're going to see things that are familiar, used in in the clever, different, really, in, in some cases, even startling ways to help us to think theologically through the story of what God wants. You know, really, again, God wanting a family, how these things echo each other in consistent patterns. This is These are the kind of, you know, Bible reading. We're not even in Bible study at this point, but just Bible reading. Um, these are the kind of Bible reading muscles that if if we were to develop, we would just get so much more out of Scripture and see it for the wonder that it is. So I'm I'm really thankful that we were able to do this, Michael, and I appreciate you coming on the the uh, the program. Well, I thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight to spend this time with you, Michael. All right, Mike, another great discussion. Again, we have a link to his book on the NakedBiblePodcast.com website. So be sure you go there and get that discount. Uh, it runs for the next 30 days. So be sure you don't miss that. And uh, also, Mike, we're going to have another interview uh, 
Chad Bird next week. You want to let us know what we're going to be talking about? Yeah, we're we're going to be talking about two books that Chad has uh, written. Chad uh, is somebody who's familiar with our content through the 1517 Project, which is a uh, part of the Lutheran uh, tradition. And I've been on their podcast. This is oh, several years ago now, but he. He has two works. One is a little older, Unveiling Mercy. It's 365 daily devotions, which is not the the kind of thing I would normally gravitate toward for the podcast. But what's interesting about this is that each one is kind of a mini Hebrew word study. So all 365 days are a different Hebrew word and talking about its meaning and context and, you know, illustrating that, uh, again, connecting dots with the New Testament. And then the second book, is called The Christ Key. The subtitle is Unlocking the Centrality of Christ in the Old Testament. So those are the two books that we're going to be discussing uh, briefly when we have Chad visit with us. I think, uh, again, listeners will get a lot out of it, and and these are good resources to, you know, jump in. In in the case of Unveiling Mercy, that devotional, if you've never even thought about a word study or don't know what a word study is, um, that's a good good place to start, even in a, in a devotional context. They'll get you on the way to doing that sort of thing in your own personal Bible study. All right. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. And with that, Mike, I want to thank you, everybody, for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.